Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to, to you. Um, welcome to uh, this Natural Capital Partners uh, webinar on how companies are building a net zero economy. My name's Jonathan Shopley. I'm uh, Managing Director for External Affairs uh, here at Natural Capital Partners and really delighted that so many of you could join us today for what we think is a, a pretty important discussion about how individual companies can drive progress towards net zero greenhouse gas emission global economy. A little bit of housekeeping as we get going. Uh, this webinar is going to last for an hour. Um, they're going to be 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, besides me, we have four speakers who will be talking about what they're doing within their companies as many case studies. And then um, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask uh, questions, for, for us to answer your questions at the end. You're going to be on, uh, on mute um, uh, throughout. So you'll have to use the chat function that you'll see to the right uh, to the right of um, uh, of your screen for questions. And don't feel you have to wait to the end. Uh, just keep them coming and uh, and we'll we'll uh, try and get through as many of those at the end as as possible. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that you will be able to download the slides that we'll be using today uh, during or towards the end of the Q and a session uh, towards the end of the webinar. So without further ado, uh, let's get down uh, to business. Now, uh, this, the origins of this webinar actually came from uh, the thinking behind this uh, emerged from uh, Talanoa Dialogues, seven Talanoa Dialogues that we ran through 2018. So just a moment about uh, a bit of explanation what the Talanoa Dialogues were. Um, the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, uh, the organization that's been um, shepherding uh, the Global Deal, the Paris Agreement, and the translation of that into a rule book, um, decided, particularly under the Fijian presidency, that they needed to break out of the negotiating brinkmanship that was making uh, the agreement and the translation of the agreement uh, into operation uh, very sluggish. And so the Fijians had proposed a different kind of conversation, the Talanoa Dialogues, which are uh, very inclusive and ask three questions. Where are we? Where do we want to get to? And how will we get there? Um, and we decided, uh, we, we sort of picked up the challenge uh, that uh, the Fijian presidency threw down to civic society and particularly to business to use the Talanoa Dialogues as an opportunity to make inputs to the UNFCCC's processes. So we ran seven roundtable uh, conversations around that question, where are we, where do we want to get to? And we made the answer to that, we wanted to get to net zero um, because that is written into the Paris Agreement and in fact was amplified by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, which published its 1.5 degree report on the last uh, day on the on the day that we held our last Talanoa dialogue, and uh, and and in fact um, they really shone a spotlight on net zero, and uh, whereas the Paris Agreement talks about net zero sometime in the second half of the century, uh, the IPCC report called for that by 2050 net zero global economy. So we were very, we felt that um, the conversations were very much on point. And what we did is we made sure um, that uh, the Talanoa Dialogues really captured businesses' experience with carbon neutrality, which we reserved or sort of applied to an individual company getting to net zero today, combining internal reductions, science-based targets, commitments to 100% renewable energy and offsetting. Um, and contrasted that or put that in the context of net zero, which we reserve for a economy-wide status of carbon neutrality at some time in the future, and according to the IPCC, at 2050. So those roundtable conversations uh, covered uh, seven locations from London, Stockholm, Amsterdam, um, Dublin, and um, uh, San Francisco which is actually where we began. 
And uh, the 61 companies that participated in that re had a combined revenue of 1.3 trillion. And on this slide, you can see uh, the logos of some of those companies and the sectors that they were from. So from that, I guess you'll, you'll get a sense of a very rich conversation, which really inspired us. Um, next slide. So one of the key outcomes of those conversations as, as they rolled across from North America to Europe um, was the fact that many of the participants did not see net zero or carbon neutrality when they were thinking about their business as an endpoint in and of itself. Uh, they saw that as an inflection point at which an abundance of affordable solutions replaces risk, climate risk with opportunity. And that's represented on this picture, which we owe to Interface. Um, and I thought really captured that spirit. Uh, if humanity changed the climate by mistake, we can certainly change it with intent. Um, so for many organizations, though, um, I, it, it, you know, zero does often feel not just like an inflection point, but a bit like an eye of the needle. You've got to squeeze your organization through. Uh, but what was very important for us, uh, very notable for us, is through those conversations, um, different companies talked about how they were getting themselves through that eye of the needle, reaching that inflection point. And that led, uh, next slide, uh, to the imprinting net zero. Uh, model, which is going to form uh, the real structure or provide the structure of, of this webinar. Next slide. Um, so I've already mentioned that from our perspective, we reserve carbon neutral for a corporate wide uh, focus on, on getting to net zero emissions. And um, there were th three prints that uh, we spoke about uh, across the Talanoas. And the first one being the footprint and everybody knows about, uh, it feels very comfortable, I guess, with that, it's reducing emissions arising directly from com a company's activities or from the purchase of energy, business travel. And then, of course, um, most organizations, particularly those that manufacture, next slide, um, have tail prints. Uh, and that little logo, that your little image you can see on next to that is actually, um, you know, from field uh, through trucking to a factory, through trucking to a distribution center and so on. So that's a representation of the tail print. And reducing emissions from suppliers in the creation of goods and services used by a company is really what we understand by the tail print. It's an upstream scope three. Um, next, um, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about handprint, particularly when we started off in San Francisco, where there was a preponderance of uh, tech IT companies uh, who felt that many of their products and services are a great opportunity to really help their customers reduce emissions arising from their use of the company's goods and services, either directly or indirectly in doing so. Now, taking care of those three prints, foot, tail and handprint to get to carbon neutral gets a company so far. But throughout the conversations we had, next slide, um, there was a recognition that companies operating uh, alone are not going to get us to a net zero global economy by 2050. We need to do more. And uh, we identified through those, um, through those interactions four prints that add to the three under carbon neutral. The first one, is brain print. So uh, it really is about uh, putting the transformation to a net zero economy and carbon neutrality at the heart of business strategy, product and service innovation. Many companies spoke about their journey from philanthropy, corporate responsibility, sustainability to making uh, net zero um, their core strategic or one of their core strategic objectives. The next one, of course, is that having an idea, uh, a purpose and a goal doesn't always translate into action unless you have a blueprint uh, which identifies the investments, the partnerships, the governance and the technology that underpins a plan to deliver against those goals. And beyond that, uh, the brain print and the blueprint, we also spoke a great deal about the fact that in corporations, uh, organizations um, that are embedding net zero in their strategies and in their operations, they need to find a connection to individual staff members throughout the organization to bring it to life. 
uh, bring it to life. So making the strategy personal and relevant to all staff and management uh, is what we mean by the fingerprint. And then one final one that takes us to seven is newsprint. And uh, this is really about the fact that organizations that take action, put net zero at the heart of their strategies uh, and reach out to their customers and their staff really need to communicate that. And the other word for that would be advocate to advocate for the power of net zero. So the communicate and advocate to set climate strategies free from the confines of sustainability reports, put them into branding, positioning, policy, uh, negotiations, etc., is what we mean by newsprint. So um, that takes us, um, uh, that's a rather quick gallop through uh, the imprint model that we're going to use to structure the interventions of this, uh, the presentations from our, our, four, um, our four speakers. So next slide. Um, uh, what we're going to do is actually ask uh, our four speakers, which are from PwC, Betty's and Taters Group, ING and LinkedIn, to pick out four of the seven uh, and to focus on, on footprint, tailprint, brainprint and fingerprint. Um, but before I turn over to uh, our speakers, um, it would be useful for us uh, to calibrate uh, where you all are uh, as an audience by doing a quick poll. So uh, on the next slide, uh, what you'll see is a question, a real simple one for your company. Is a net zero economy on balance uh, a risk? A risk and opportunity in equal measure, an opportunity, or are you undecided? I'm going to give you a few seconds just to vote on that, and then we'll present the results. So uh, the voting form is up. Um, organizers and panelists are not voting, uh, so we're not influencing the result. And uh, when my colleague Alex tells me that there's um, uh, a good representation, we'll uh, fling up uh, the results. So um, uh, that's encouraging. Um, nobody thinks that it's a risk. Uh, and I guess that's because the risk of not getting to that is probably pretty high. A uh, risk and an opportunity in equal measure, but it is uh, seen by the majority of you as an opportunity. Um, and I can understand that some are undecided as to just how those risks and opportunities play out over a strategic horizon within a corporation. So thank you all for your votes. And now I'm going to use that as an opportunity and a background um, to introducing our first speaker, uh, Jacqueline Hemery, Environmental Manager at PwC Global. Uh, it, was, it was great to have uh, Jackie um, at our London event um, as, as, as a client representing, you know, much of their experience on the footprinting side. So Jackie, over to you. Um, and Alex, if you could load the next slide. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so we thought one of uh, a good place to probably get us started uh, would be to give you just a bit of background and context on uh, PwC. Um, so PwC is a global network of professional service firms that deliver assurance tax and, tax and advisory services. Um, over the past financial year, uh, over 250,000 people in 158 countries worked at PwC. Um, and our wider purpose as um, as an organization is to build trust in society uh, and, and solve important problems. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the uh, one of the really exciting things that happened uh, fairly recently is that whilst a lot of uh, PwC member firms have been doing a lot within um, within the environment and driving a lot of change within their organization. Um, for the first time uh, last year, uh, we had a global commitment. Um, and um, basically uh, 22 of PwC's largest firms that represent nearly 90% of our global revenue committed to drive efficiencies to reduce our absolute carbon footprint, grow 100% renewable, and to offset our air travel emissions. 
Um, so under the light of this new commitment is a little bit of, I guess, the, the rationale of why um, Jonathan and the team at Natural Capital Partners have asked us to, to give a bit of context and background of how we came to that commitment um, and what we're, we're looking to drive through that. Um, next slide. Right. Um, so I thought it would be useful just um, starting out the um, with the webinar is just to give you a bit of a background of um, how we view uh, climate change and this issue within PwC um, and why we felt really now was a time to take action um, and accelerate um, accelerate our, our activities within this area. So as several of you know, there is a wide consensus amongst the scientific community um, that if temperatures increase above uh, two degrees Celsius, um, it is a threshold that could cause irreversible environmental change. Um, another uh, thing that we're aware of is that decarbonisation rates are currently less than half of what we need to achieve that two degrees. Um, and while PwC doesn't have one of the biggest uh, footprints out there because we are a professional service firm, uh, we do recognize that we need a healthy environment uh, to have a healthy economy. Um, and we also believe that to have a solution uh, to these large problems, we all need to play our part. Um, so really having this global commitment creates alignment amongst uh, PwC firms. Uh, it makes us accountable and it creates momentum uh, around a huge topic that really um, is changing a lot of things. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I think uh, it would be quite useful just to give you a bit of background that um, when setting up a new commitment or a new target, um, it's really important to first look and understand your own footprint. Um, so whilst uh, a lot of the companies on the webinar today will share what they have done, um, there's often a good foundation and background and study and research that happened before that helps identify um, the different projects and activities um, that are most suited to them. Um, so I guess just to highlight that um, if your organisation is considering something like this, that is a huge um, uh, benefit and a good starting point. Um, so one of the things that we realised uh, at PwC is that over 90% of our global footprint currently comes from the energy that we use in our building, um, in our buildings and through uh, air travel. Um, so for this webinar, I'll be focusing a little bit around the scope one and two emissions. So the energy that we consume in our buildings. Um, and telling you, giving you a bit more detail around that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the first uh, starting point really of our um, new commitment uh, and the foundation is really uh, to drive efficiencies, to find ways to reduce our absolute emissions. Um, so there has already been some really great things that have been happening uh, across our network. Uh, an example of that is that since 2007, for example, PwC has managed to reduce their scope one and two emissions by 84%. Um, so we've been seeing some really fantastic initiatives. And what we're trying to do globally is really um, identify um, those strengths, uh, those opportunities that exist, and hopefully share that experience and knowledge um, throughout our network so that we can all benefit uh, and learn from each other. Um, so one of the things that we're currently working on is an energy efficiency guidance. Um, and really what that does is it identifies um, opportunities and energy efficiency measures that are tailored to the PwC context. Uh, so the types of offices that we are in, um, our contracting model with different landlords, for example, um, and it takes all of that into consideration so that each uh, country can tailor and adapt that um, to their local circumstances. Uh, another thing that we're also uh, driving and I think is really important is uh, behavioral change campaigns. Um, so uh, 
I think it can often be quite surprising uh, where you can find um, some really, really useful ideas. Um, so it's really important that when you are on, um, on a journey to try and reduce your uh, emissions, is to really make everyone aware of this wider target that you have and kind of bring them on board to help make that change. Um, so those are two key initiatives that we're really driving over the next couple of years to um, help us drive efficiencies. Uh, next slide, please. And um, Jackie, just to say you've got a one minute warning, but I know you're on your last slide, so thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll be super efficient. Um, so uh, just here to mention that we recognize that whilst we will be driving efficiencies, uh, we will still be consuming um, energy. Um, so what we have decided to do is that uh, over the next couple of years, uh, we will be going 100% renewable. Um, and one of the key things that we've done is that we have joined RE100. Um, that is a membership of um, influential uh, organizations across the world that are making a public commitment uh, towards going renewable um, and I think one of the key things around that is that it helps um, it generates momentum around the renewables movement uh, it highlights that there's a demand for renewables it also uh, brings credibility uh, because there's reporting requirements um, uh, it enhances transparency um, so those are just some of the, the examples of how we're looking to, to drive renewables. Um, and Jonathan, I'll let you jump in uh, as you need to, so I don't go over time. That was wonderful, thank you. Uh, just a very quick question, and I think we can just get out of the way. It was, uh, do you offset all business travel or just air travel? So can we have an answer to that uh, straight away? And we'll keep the more uh, sort of wider questions to the end. Yes, of course. Uh, so at the moment, it is air travel. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. And I'm sure there's issues there about how you collect all kinds of travel, you know, and, and you've certainly touched on the importance of, you know, setting up the structures for uh, good footprinting. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. And now we're going to move to our second speaker, uh, Simon Hodgkin, uh, Head of Sustainable Development at Betty's and Taylor's Group. And Simon is going to talk to us about the tailprint work um, that Betty's and Taylor's group is, is involved in. Over to you, Simon. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tailprint of um, specifically Yorkshire Tea and Taylor's of Harrogate coffee blends. Um, so, so Betty's and Taylor's groups, um, it's a family owned business. Um, but primarily we're about quality tea and coffee. We're, we're about doing the right thing and doing things properly. You can see on the Yorkshire tea box there, we have this slogan um, of let's have a proper brew. And that, that concept and ethos of a proper brew runs, runs through pretty much everything we do. Um, but we're also about relationships. And I think it's some combination of doing things properly and our relationships with our farmers that led us to um, taking responsibility and investing in, um, in the tailprint of our business. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, Talanoa report that um, that Natural Capital Partners submitted back to the UN talked about the upstream scope three emissions being substantial, particularly in commodity supply chains. And I think this this slide certainly um, highlights that. So in 2016, um, we set off towards our um, journey of becoming carbon neutral, or at least to have carbon neutral products. Um, and we drew a boundary that was from tea and coffee bush at one end through to the supermarket shelf, the retailer at the other end. And you can see here that more than 80% of our um, total emissions are in the upstream part of our supply chain. And, and primarily that's in the agronomy, the agricultural inputs, the processing and manufacturing of tea and coffee in, in country of origin, 67% you can see there. Uh, in comparison, the rest of the um, supply chain are, are quite small numbers. So shipping the um, product from uh, the farm to the to the port of entry in the UK, 14%. The packaging that we use here in the UK to to um, uh, to, to merchandise our products, 12%. Manufacturing in terms of our scope one and two emissions, 8%. And you can see onward distribution and, and wastage and leakage from the system, pretty small in comparison. Um, 
So I will focus on, on the tail print. Just very quickly, I'll talk about our, our manufacturing. So you can see there the dotted uh, purple line. And just to say that since 2012, we've managed to reduce our scope one and two emissions by 94% and, and increased our energy efficiency by 16%. And that's primarily through um, the procurement of renewable energy, gas and electricity, uh, installation of PV, biogas digesters and so on. Um, so, so, you know, clearly we have a huge material issue in our supply chain, but some of the low hanging fruit nearby we, we've already um, we've already addressed also. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we set off on our carbon neutral products journey, um, we kind of had three visions. Um, so we wanted to take uh, a planet view, so planetary view, and, and we had uh, an ambition to, to play our part um, towards climate action. We have a long history of uh, tree planting and tree uh, forest preservation. And we wanted our next phase of tree planting activity to really um, play its part in, in our carbon neutral journey. We had a sourcing vision. Um, so there's a real commercial imperative behind the work we're doing here, which is about the long term security of supply of quality tea and coffee. Um, that if we were going to somehow work with uh, reducing our footprint, that that should also benefit our trading relationships and primarily benefit um, the livelihoods of the farmers who we rely on in our supply chain. And thirdly, we had a brand vision, which was about earning the badge. So again, playing to this ethos of properness, we wanted to have a credible and authentic um, consumer facing story. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we could have um, turned on carbon neutrality pretty much overnight by going out to the market, buying carbon credits um, and, and you know, claiming them as our own and offsetting the emissions in our supply chain. But what we chose to do instead was um, build three projects that are um, directly in our supply chain. So these are with tea and coffee farmers. And there's a tree planting project, which is about community reforestation in Kenya. And then two other projects which are about avoided deforestation actually. So the introduction of fuel efficient stoves into our um, coffee farming communities in Uganda and tea farming communities in Malawi. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about the Kenyan project in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but we, we're in, on top of our investment in these three programs, um, just to highlight that there's an additional $8 million worth of benefit in terms of livelihood improvement and um, yield improvement through good agricultural practices um, that are going into this program as well. So we, we really set off with the view of, um, you know, carbon being a byproduct of a farm li farmer livelihoods program. So from three projects, one and a half million trees, and that's about planting a million new indigenous trees in Kenya, uh, and then avoided deforestation of half a million in the in the other two countries. We think we're going to reach um, around 470,000 people across 120,000 farms, all in our supply chain. And then, as I said, 105,000 uh, fuel efficient stoves also being um, distributed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is why. Um, so, so I'll talk more specifically about Kenya. And in 2015, um, we commissioned a piece of work which was climate change modeling out to 2050 in two of the key tea growing regions in the world, actually, both in Kenya. Um, and particularly the area, um, if, you, if you look at the, the map on the left hand side, the current state, there are two growing regions, one which is west of the Rift Valley uh, and one to the east of the Rift. And it's the east of the Rift that we focused on. It's where the, the highest quality product is coming from. Um, and what you can see out to 2050 is um, actually that the, the suitability for green tea, the, the green areas on the map there, the suitability changes considerably. So the elevation at which tea can be grown increases. We're effectively chasing tea up Mount Kenya and up the Aberdares watershed. Um, but also we were noticing um, increasingly unpredictable weather patterns. So um, typically in, increased um, periods of drought, more intense rainfall, really conditions that aren't particularly suitable to um, tea and tea agronomy. Uh, next slide, please. So 50% of our um, tea pretty much comes from this area around um, Mount Kenya. Um, and this is a bit more detail about the program. So as I've said, it was a community reforestation pro project. It's an 11 year commitment um, from tailors to work with our kind of key farmers, I guess, in that region um, to plant a million trees. 
we're investing about a million dollars in the program, uh, the, the benefit back to the farmers in terms of di diversification, improved um, yields, good agricultural practices, climate, smart agriculture, and so on, is an additional $4 million. Um, it's a long-term partnership, so this was this was playing to our agenda of um, uh, you know farmer farmer relationships and security of supply into the future. We managed to generate some PR value through uh, tie-in with uh, the Gruffalo and Julia Donaldson, so periodically converted Yorkshire tea over to Yorkshire tree. Uh, but fundamentally, this was delivering 30% towards our carbon neutral product certification. Um, and that's pretty much where we are today. So we have um, three programs. I, I just say also that this is primarily about insetting. Um, what we're also doing is uh, now working towards reducing the emissions from 68 tea factories across um, Kenya. So we've conducted a carbon footprinting process with those 68 factories. They in turn have in introduced energy efficiency committees um, and efficiency roadmaps at each factory. So, so we're not just offsetting, we're also reducing our impact. That's me, thank you. Simon, brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, first of all, I just want to say, keep the questions rolling in. I'm keeping an eye on them. There are a couple for you, but we'll keep them to the end and we'll probably come back to the sort of carbon neutral product uh, concept in our, in, our, uh, in our final poll. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to move uh, to our third speaker, um, Caitlin Crouch-Hess, Senior Sustainability Consultant at ING. Um, and and host uh which hosted our um our amsterdam telenor so thank you for that and thank you in an anticipation for uh your presentation that's to come caitlin over to you great thank you jonathan so we can go to the first slide um so maybe just to start off with an introduction of ing uh, we are a multinational Dutch-based wholesale and retail bank serving more than 37 million customers across roughly 40 countries worldwide. And as a financial, we have a purpose to empower people to stay a step ahead in life and in business. And we are able to do this via our financial products and services and via our IT platforms and mobile um, banking applications. And we're actually a pioneer uh, in the internet and mobile banking front. But empowering people goes far beyond providing banking applications, of course. Staying a step ahead um, of the challenges our clients are facing will require bold action and putting our financing to work. So next slide, please. With a lending portfolio of more than 600 billion euros, our biggest impact, of course, lies within the projects and clients we finance. So that's why last year, uh, during the Global Climate Action Summit, uh, which you probably all know about in San Francisco, ING uh, publicly announced our big commitment to steer our entire lending portfolio towards the well below two degrees goal of the Paris Climate Agreement. But of course, before we could go out there with this uh, rather big ambition, as we felt it was, um, we really had to figure out how. How would we move 600 billion euros in the right direction? And likewise, how can a bank like ING really measure our so-called handprint in such a way that this informs business decisions and strategy? This would require measurement to be very precise, in fact, um, to have client level granularity. So essentially taking into account the uh, emissions of each of our clients. And ideally, we would need this to be forward looking, which we all know that uh, carbon footprints typically are the um, covering the previous year. So for this reason, um, we've had to s sort of redefine what a handprint is for a bank um, because we spent literally, uh, I think, a, close to two years trying to work out how uh, to measure so-called financed emissions, as I just um, explained. And this ultimately, unfortunately, did not work for ING. Uh, due to a widespread lack of data, we were um, basically forced to use sector averages and assumptions, which really left us with very little insight for valuable um, target setting information. Because to be clear, um, measuring our handprint in this case, our, our financed emissions, was never about just measuring. We always wanted to be able to have a meaningful metric, a meaningful measurement that would allow us to steer. And because we had such um, proxy and assumption um, uh, laden data, 
uh, it would be something like setting a target to reduce the emissions of, um, to give an example, of your company's headquarters, knowing only the number of square meters and then the global average CO2 per square meter, meter for an office building. Um, so, of course, the only way you could actually reduce your emissions using this level of data would be to reduce the square meters of your building. And we know that's not possible. Um, so you can click, please. Uh, so while the financed emissions approach didn't work for us as a metric, um, this exercise did act as a sort of hotspot analysis. So it helped us to know where to focus first in terms of um, lending exposure and carbon intensity. We therefore started with the oil and gas sector, power generation, automotive, shipping, aviation, cement, steel, commercial real estate, and residential housing sectors, um, which is quite a lot, as you can imagine. Um, so next slide, please. But back to our how. How could ING effectively measure our portfolio in a way that would really allow us to steer our portfolio? And for us, the answer is Terra. And Terra is uh, the term we use for ING's strategy to steer our portfolio using a sector by sector um, approach. So this means that each sector will need to be aligned with the Paris climate goals. Um, of course, getting there has required us to sort of go back to the climate metrics drawing board, if you will, and to take a really hard look at what data we already had, which was most meaningful to climate indicators. And actually, the solution ended up being quite simple. Um, as a bank, we don't finance emissions per se. We finance economic activity. Um, and therefore, banks, as a bank, we feel that our role is to finance change, to be able to help our clients um, and finance their transition. So by measuring our exposure to certain economic activities and technologies, such as electric vehicle production of our clients or gas power generation, um, we can compare this to what external scenarios say needs to change over time. So um, this helps us to really steer focus within sectors based on um, the clients that we choose and uh, the technologies within sectors and their concentration. So you can click, please. Um, but of course, we could not do this alone. Uh, partnership has been really important. Um, so shortly after coming to our own conclusion about the best way to go about all of this, uh, we learned about the global think tank, the Two Degrees Investing Initiative, um, and their PACTA approach, as it is, as it is called. Because um, they developed this for the equity and bond portfolio um, community. So we reached out to them to partner on translating that approach into an approach that works for bank lending portfolios. Um, a, the, this will, of course, undergo continuous improvement over time. The approach needs to be tested by more banks, um, but ING is already working to conduct um, the necessary analyses to inform our, our business decisions. Um, so within Terra, our, our strategy, we will apply tools and approaches like PACTA, which are First of all, impact driven. So like I said, focusing on sectors with the biggest climate impact. Um, they need to be sector specific because we fundamentally believe that each sector has their own transition pathway to take. Uh, they should be forward looking ideally because it's not about where our clients are today per se, but where they are transitioning to in the future. So we want to have an engagement centered approach. They should be science-based, uh, so therefore aligned with a t well below two degrees scenario, um, such as those developed by independent organizations like the IEA. They should be technology-based, uh, focusing on underlying assets that we finance um, that are produced or operated by our clients, just to be clear. Um, and then open source. So this is something that we also very much believe in. We want this to be applied not just to ING, but to other banks, which we'll get to in a moment. So next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to give you a little, uh, I, I know uh, you, you told me about your timing, just to give you a, a, a minute or so uh, warning. Great. Thank, Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> so maybe just to give you an impression of what alignment looks like. Um, of course, we'll need to make use, and we do need to make use of all of the tools in our tool belt, so to speak, from policies to products to sector strategies. Um, and to that end, uh, if you can click, please, ING issued a pretty strict coal policy recently, which will result in us exiting coal by 2025. 
can click, please. We are also focusing on our roughly 300 billion mortgage portfolio with an ambition to eventually have an energy positive portfolio. Uh, click, please. ING was also the first bank to develop the sustainability performance linked loan, which we call the sustainability improvement loan. Um, and this will uh, tie the interest rate of the loan to the performance of the client on certain targets click please. Uh, and we are also working on sector specific targets and KPIs in order to of course steer uh, the portfolios in line with the climate goals. Next slide please. Um, but as I said with the huge need that um, our society faces there are trillions needed in finance for the low carbon transition. Um, this really must go beyond ING. Uh, and so we really believe that the most successful we could be is by collaborating, collaborating within our sector. Um, so ING was actually joined, you can click please, by four global peers, uh, BBVA, BNB Paribas, Société Générale and Standard Chartered, uh, who also have decided to commit to steering enti their entire loan, uh, loan books towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and we uh, represent more than 2.4 trillion uh, euros in lending. And we certainly don't think it will stop there. We expect more to, uh, signatories to be announced this year. So in conclusion, it's been quite a journey <laughs> from redefining hand printing metrics that would allow us to put our brain prints to work uh, to really driving this internal business strategy in such a way that we can truly empower our customers, but of course also our sector and ideally uh, society to stay a step ahead. So uh, thank you. Caitlin, thank you. That was a terrific um, explanation and a combination of handprint and brainprint. Um, so really appreciate that. And and with without further ado, I'm going to move on now. And uh, and thank you. Please keep your questions coming. Uh, there there are a good number that have come in, but please don't stop. Um, Peggy Brannigan, uh, Global Program Manager of uh, um, Environmental Sustainability at LinkedIn, is our, our last speaker, uh, somebody who participated in our San Francisco Talano, which was largely dominated by the tech companies, which of course have got a very intriguing uh, view on, um, on neutrality. Peggy, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to bring it home by sharing our LinkedIn program for carbon fingerprint. And that is how we help our leadership and our employees understand that climate action is truly personally relevant to them. So first of all, we have to look at our footprint. And um, you can see that uh, we have a pretty big footprint and it's growing. We have 580 million members, probably most of you on this call. We have 13,000 employees and they work in 3 million square feet of office space around the world. Our data centers are growing rapidly to keep up with all of our members online activity, but we are committed to climate action. So we just made an audacious pledge. LinkedIn will reduce our absolute carbon emissions by 75% by 2030. And that's off of a base of 2013 when we were much smaller. And you can see from the pie chart that data center emissions and business travel are really the two biggest targets that I'm looking to for improvement. Next slide. So our um, carbon reduction pledge is one of our five public sustainability goals. And I'll run through those quickly with you. Um, first, we're on a path to operating with 100% clean energy. And as most of the other panelists have said, the first priority is to drive efficiency, reduce our energy use, buy renewables, and then finally offset whatever's remaining. Uh, we're driving towards zero waste of water and materials, and we have a long way to go, but we're going. Our fourth goal is to support employee engagement and well-being. And the fifth goal is really where we're focusing longer term because that has the biggest potential. We want to leverage our platform to help the rest of the world operate more sustainably. So we're building a green skills learning path as part of LinkedIn Learning. And we're working with all of the tremendous mountains of data that we have about workers and jobs and skills. Um, and we are publishing um, periodic reports about growth in, in green jobs and the green economy. Next slide. 
So how is LinkedIn creating a fingerprint to educate and mobilize people around our company so that they will all help me and our team realize our sustainability goals? Well, as a first step, we implemented an internal carbon fee. And you're probably familiar with the term, and it's something that was pioneered by a parent company, Microsoft. Um, we measure the annual carbon emissions from our data centers, our workplaces, our employee travel, commute, et cetera. And then we estimate the total that it would cost after we've driven efficiency and reduction as much as we can, how much would it cost to purchase offsets and recs to offset the remainder to achieve carbon neutrality? And we charge a carbon fee to the data center division, the workplace division, and individual travelers based on their respective portion of total carbon emissions. And this fee is a vehicle for me then to start a conversation with the leaders in our data center and workplace teams and to signal to our individual employees that they do have a carbon impact and they can shrink it and they will pay for it if they don't. Um, and I'll just refer the listeners to a white paper that Microsoft published in 2013 about how to implement a carbon fee. And then secondly, um, the um, follow-on white paper they published in 2016 about going beyond carbon neutrality toward net positive. Next slide. So the second step in developing our fingerprint was to launch a green team program, which we call Go Green. Now we have Go Green teams of really passionate employees in 20 of our 30 sites, uh, more than 1,200 people, and more chapters are opening every quarter. And they meet regularly once or twice a month to plan green activities in their local offices. And we also have global campaigns that we run through them as well. So of course, right now we're gearing up for April's events around Earth Day. These employee volunteers are really my most important allies, allies. It's for our corporate sustainability team, for our office site managers, and for our program managers. The Go Greeners provide a reality check when we have ideas, and they give a lot of creative input when we want to roll out some kind of green initiative that's going to require changes in attitudes and changes in behavior. Our Go Green members help raise awareness with other employees. They set up digital screens, they do lunch and learn events, and they help us implement competitions, and I'm going to tell you about one of those in a minute. They really provide a lot of manpower to make good things happen. And you know, my favorite thing is they keep asking me, why don't we do X? Why don't we do Y? So why don't we? Let's try. Um, so next slide. I want to give you two examples um, of activating our employee base. So the first is our green team is helping us roll out a sustainable travel program. And you saw how large the travel slice is of our total emissions. So first, we're encouraging employees to travel sustainably and to strategically skip a trip sometimes and use VC. You'll see on the screen we have a whole list of um, green um, travel tips that have to do with um, uh, class of travel and routes, etc. As I mentioned, we collect an internal carbon fee from individual travelers every time they book a ticket. And then I take those travel fees and purchase offsets. But I wanted to make sure that our employees felt that they owned their carbon impact and the offset investments. So we had a handful of our green team leaders help us deliver a webinar for our short list of seven carbon offset projects that we were considering. And then we invited all our employees worldwide to vote to choose the three finalists. And then we worked with natural capital partners to create a custom carbon calculator that our employees are using now to estimate their own personal carbon footprint. And so they can buy the same offsets to cover their personal impacts. Uh, last slide. One more example of making sustainability become a personal quest for our employees is our workplace energy competitions. It started two years ago with an energy hack for our building that was designed and built to be net zero, but was not performing that way. We were consuming more energy inside than uh, was being produced by the solar panels on the roof. So we asked the building occupants to hack the problem. We split the building in half, recruited team captains, and let them hack the energy problem. And I should note that the people working in that building are data engineers and computer programmers. So they really loved this. We had a, 
um, dashboard set up, they could see daily um, how they were um, impacting the problem. They identified opportunities for lighting, HVAC, other protocols. They hacked the flood load. Um, the building occupants really came up with a lot of good solutions. It was a huge success, 23% improvement in energy use, and that's been maintained for a year. So we rolled out the energy competition through our Go Green leads to a lot of our other large buildings around the world. And this year we're going to do the same thing with an employee hack for waste diversion. So in summary, I, I just shared some really practical ways that we are implementing a green fingerprint. And we're doing that not only because it helps us reach our sustainability goals, but it's so important and valuable for a company in the larger context because not only do we generate operational efficiencies and save money and um, operate sustainably, but it really does tap into employees' sense of satisfaction, their pride in working for a company that is investing to be responsible and inviting them to be you know, the main drivers of that journey. And it helps us recruit new talent. So we're, we're really excited about this and we wanna keep going. Um, that concludes my presentation. Peggy, that was marvelous. Thank you, thank you so much and thank you to all four. Um, now we are gonna go just a little, running a little behind our own clock so we might skip uh, the neck of the poll uh, and go straight to Q&A and we've had a lot of questions actually and I think I'm going to, what I'm going to do just looking at the time is I'm going to try and consolidate them a little bit and then just go around all of our panelists um, uh, and you can choose which of, uh, you know, which of these to sort of focus on. There's a general theme uh, about the, f you know, how you measure the things that are difficult to measure. You know, for example, when people work from home, or whether you, when you've got data centers that you uh, share with others. Um, so I think uh, maybe just a word from each of you about how. Um, how you deal with you know the complexities of establishing that baseline that that I think all of you have you know uh, have spoken to as being important um, and in fact uh, a couple of questions about whether you're using any kinds of environmental management systems like ISO 14001 or EMAS which is the European equivalent uh, so something along those lines and then um, more sort of wider looking um, there's a question about um, well you know we in organizing this, ask each of you, and you've been very good about this, to focus on one of the prints. Um, but the general question is, um, outside of the print that you covered, you know, which one of the seven do you think uh, has most power for your organization and, and why? Um, and I think, you know, some of the questions that have come in have been around the circular economy, uh, working not just with supply chain partners, but perhaps closing the loop. And um, so some of those uh, complexities, how do they fit in? Are they in the uh, sort of newsprint or blueprint part of of the model? So with with those general sense of where the questions are, because we would never get through all, all of those that we've got. Uh, um, um, can I just go down the panel again? Um, and Jackie, if we could start with you, uh, pick up those that you want to make a few comments on, and I'll give you about a minute or so each. Over to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, um, so I think one of the things I can I can definitely relate with some of the questions is in like, how do you measure things that are complicated to measure? Because I think we've all come across those kind of issues, um, and I think. Um, the best advice that I can give from our perspective is to be as conservative as you can um, because we all recognize that climate change is a huge, huge challenge. Um, so it's better to be conservative in these uh, instances. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is also really useful if you're looking for information is that there are tons of uh, different associations and working groups that are currently out there um, so i definitely would recommend to have a look at what your peers are doing because um, i think that's also a great source of information um, and things that where we are also looking for assistance to figure things out where we don't have the answer either 
Um, so I think that area around collaboration is really important. Um, and I think uh, from one of the other questions that you mentioned that I think would be good to quickly touch on was around um, what do you think uh, has the most power and why? Um, I mean, I think one of the one of the really important things is um, to to generate a commitment. But not only having a commitment is really where the power exists. Um, the power really exists in, in how you action that within your company um, and how you engage your staff um, and your business within that commitment. And that's where you'll really be able to make uh, a change. Um, so like the, that's the blueprint one, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jackie. And you've packed a lot in uh, to the little time that I've given you. Simon, moving on to you. Um, and I know there was one uh, very specific question about whether you're uh, promoting renewable energy within your supply chain. Uh, but uh, over to you to pick up the, um, uh, the, the main questions that have been asked. Um, yeah, just very quickly on that question, we are we are to some degree. So a lot of um, tea in our supply chain is is um, clearly it's dried as part of that process. So um, the consumption of wood and fuel to dry that the tea is um, a significant contributor. So yeah, we've worked with a couple of tea factories in Kenya, converting them over to um, biomass, so sort of agricultural waste products as as a fuel input. So yes, we are doing that. I think also just on that end of the supply chain, the, the access to data was, was a frustration for us at the point of doing the LCA. And that was one of the factors that led us to do the carbon footprinting program with 68 factories in our supply chain was to bring that granularity of primary data and, and some kind of hotspot analysis um, to our future work at Origin. Um, so some empathy with people who are, who are struggling with that. Mm -hmm. I think also then, um, the print of the future, I think handprint is going to be increasingly important around how we lead consumers to a more sustainable lifestyle. I was um, I was interviewing a candidate this morning for our, for our role here who told me off. They were quite um, they were quite out outraged actually at the, the plastic gate and how plastic is in tea bags. It's the first time I've been told off in an interview. Um, but they, I think that's a sign of um, consumers of the future and, and um, you know, that there's a commercial imperative around not just net zero, but actually going way beyond that eco design principles, creating products that actually lend themselves to a sustainable future. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, over to you. And I mean, you, you were, you did sort of link handprint and, and brainprint together. So in a way you've sort of answered that question, but pick out the themes that you'd like to emphasize. Uh, in this last minute or so. Sure, yeah, I, I may be a bit biased, but I, I do think that for us, brain print really... Uh, uh, you, you seem to be a bit faint, uh, uh, Caitlin. You might be a little further away from your mic. Is this better? Much better, thank you. Yeah. Great. No, um, I think for us, the, the biggest um, importance for us would be the brain print. Um, also simply because this is where transformation really takes place, especially for a financial. Um, so I, I, I certainly think that for us, brain print would, would have to be the one that we would <clears throat> give the most importance to also because we know that's indeed where the biggest impact lies for us as a bank. If we're really able to move our strategy um, as, a, as a business um, and focus on the decisions we're making as a lender, um, yeah, I think that we can have the biggest transformation for society. And I just wanted to say quickly on uh, how to measure. Um, my advice would be to not try to boil the ocean, but as many of the presentations showed here, really focus on where the biggest impact is concentrated. I, I think that that's probably quite logical. But for us, we had to, even though I listed many sectors that we're focusing on, that only makes um, a portion of, of the entire scope that we eventually need to bring on board. So that would be my advice as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Peggy, uh, you have pretty much the last word. Um, oh. So uh, uh, over to you. Yeah, I'll just touch on one thing that came up in the questions, and that is how do you uh, implement these initiatives when you're working through a landlord in your buildings or in, with a co-location arrangement for your data centers? And so what we've done, we report to CDP and we gather through the landlords all of our um, kilowatt hours of energy use, and we have 
complicated formulas with uh, meeting the greenhouse gas protocols and working with consultants to crunch those numbers. And they all come out as science-based targets. Um, but then we really do have to work with the people who own the buildings that we're using. And so I guess I'll just point to one recent success. Um, we have a lot of people in our Bangalore office and we co-locate. Uh, and we have, multi, you know, it's a multi-tenant situation and we did work through the landlord over a period of time and we've executed a contract so that we are able to participate in a new solar project there to gather energy to power our operations. So it's definitely more complicated, but it's worth the effort. Peggy, thank you, uh, and, and uh, great advice to end on. Um, we're just about at the top of the hour, and so uh, what I would like to do is, first of all, to reassure people who've asked questions that haven't been directly answered, that we'll be putting those to the panelists, and we'll get back to you with uh, with answers to, to all of them. But um, great job, panel, in, in really picking up a, a rich, uh, number of queries that people had in, in in their minds. Just moving on then to close out. Um, next slide, if you would. Um, just wanted to point out that um, the Talano report that we submitted to the UNFCCC on behalf of the um, the 61 corporates that relied on us to distill all of this into uh, advice and and requests from policymakers and also uh, this this useful model. Um, that report contains other uh, many case studies from Microsoft, Marks and Spencer's, Interface, Elipac, BP, Target Neutral, uh, Scania, uh, Intuit, and Intel. Uh, so really would recommend a scan of that report. And speaking about that, next slide. Um, we do have resources available. Um, it is possible uh, to download this deck uh, from uh, your little control box on, on the right-hand side. Um, and a video recording will be up on our website. Uh, and the final Talanoa Dialogue report that I've just mentioned um, is at naturalcapitalpartners.com at um, uh, Talanoa. Um, I also, uh, the, the speakers have all agreed that uh, very welcome to take uh, emails from you if you have specific questions that we won't, uh, that we don't answer. Uh, in other words, that you haven't uh, put to us today. Uh, email addresses are on the right hand side. And uh, we as Natural Capital Partners uh, have really, it's been a privilege for us to work uh, with the four companies that are presented today and also to be part of that uh, really rich dialogue uh, that we had through the, um, the Talanoa events. And we will be at a couple of events in the coming months, Greenbiz in Phoenix in February uh, 26, 28. Let us know if you're going to be there and would like to meet us. Uh, similarly, uh, the Rec Market meeting in Amsterdam, uh, 12th and 13th of March. And then finally, uh, um, the Climate Leadership Conference uh, in Baltimore uh, for North American uh, audience on uh, the 20th uh, to the 22nd of March, where actually we're doing a, a session on uh, carbon neutrality and, and net zero as part of that event. So um, I, I think without further ado, I'm going to um, deck now on, on the right hand side uh, and, and, and we're also able to email uh, the link to participants. I, it leaves me just uh, to thank you all for attending uh, uh, this, this webinar and, and finally again, Thank you to our four panelists, our speakers, who gave really terrific presentations, um, speaking to the imprint model uh, in a short uh, amount of time with very high impact. Thank you to you. We're closing the webinar now. Thanks again.